started. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon. And um, this is our innovation uh, seminar series in the College of Medicine. And, and uh, really, the, the goals of this uh, series are, are twofold. One is really to, to celebrate medical innovation in our community, uh, on our campus, uh, within our college, and really to, um, to provide examples of people that have been successful, role models, people that we can gain new insights from. The second goal really is just to build a community. And so uh, we're represented here, but we're also simulcasting to Carl in the Pollard Auditorium there. So it's, um, uh, we're again trying to build this community between Carl and, and campus and, and with, throughout our college. Uh, I also just want to give a shout out to a couple of people, Jim Pate and Todd Gibi and uh, many others that have helped set this, this all up, all the logistics, um, Angie Ellis as well to, to coordinate all the, uh, um, the logistics of this. And, and these types of events you know, don't happen without a lot of help going in. I just want to be the, be the one and really my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. The, what we'll do is we'll have our speaker for about 30 minutes, but then we also have a, a, a panel of other faculty and, and people within the college and campus uh, to give some reflections in their own perspective. And I think that also is a way then of, of kind of broadening our discussion. And of course, there's always opportunities for questions along the way. So it really is my uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker, Gary Drack. Uh, today. He, uh, he came to us, uh, started at Purdue University uh, with an engineering degree and, and has been involved throughout his entire life in really med tech innovation. Uh, starting in with Coulter Corporation, uh, working at Purdue's and establishing Purdue's uh, cytometry laboratory, uh, um, being the director of the biotechnology center here in the cytometry core uh, facility. Really, this theme of, of flow cytometry and analyzing cells uh, in many different ways. He, um, uh, he is also an entrepreneur. And uh, in 1995, he founded Cytometry Services here, which evolved into to eyesight, and which was later acquired by Sony and Sony Biotech. And, and, and I think what you'll see is some really nice examples of, of how ideas that can generate out of this, this ecosystem here uh, you know, can expand really to the national, the global scale. Uh, currently, he's a principal cytometrist, an engineering fellow for Cyte, um, CyteNome, and, uh, and is also founder and president of TechMill, which is a, a design engineering and a small scale uh, manufacturing company here associated uh, and located in the University Research Park. Um, it really is, like I said, a pleasure to have Gary speak today because uh, we've asked him to present really the ecosystem that's here and the opportunities that are here for any of our, our students, our, our faculty, our physicians that have ideas and as part of our medical curriculum to take these ideas and, and advance them forward. And so I think Gary's going to tell us a little bit of, based on his experience just how to do that. So please join me in welcoming our, uh, Gary, our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I got everything here, and uh, is the sound about right as far as audio? Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Steve, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to share with you today. Uh, and we'll, we're also going to have a, a good Q and A session and afterward and, and discussion. And so we'll uh, have a lot of opportunity to make this interactive. I'll try to keep it short and and be uh, maybe a little bit engaging. We'll see how that goes. Not advancing anymore, so I'll use this. This. Well, but the computer doesn't advance. Yeah. Whoops. So, um, who knows how to use this computer? I don't know how to use. The computer seems to be stuck. I don't know. I can't get the page to change. It was working. We need to restart the. Uh... It was tested. I can verify that. So. So one area if someone can innovate is in how to do video conferencing in a way that it works. Okay. Thanks a lot. No, that work. Okay. So. Um, when, when you're a grandparent, you show a lot of pictures of your grandchildren. And so when you're an engineer and an old one like me, you show a lot of pictures of machines that you've built in your lifetime. And so that's kind of how it goes. 
I, I, I'm just going to kind of frame this because this is the area that I've been involved in and it's related to healthcare and so forth that I've worked in this field of flow cytometry for about 40 years now. And flow cytometry is really easy. I mean, you have a bunch of cells that are here and they get pushed through a nozzle one at a time in a, in a flowing stream and you put a laser across here and you label the cells with things like monoclonal antibodies. You may label the DNA or RNA or various dyes to tell you something you want to find. Uh, when you find something you want, you break the stream into little droplets and you use electromagnetics to steer the little droplets into collection tubes and they stay alive. And it's just really cool. I mean, it's if you've ever done the, uh, the uh, electromagnetics engineering course, it's the very, very large plate with the infinitely small particle, Coulomb's law with the charge on the surface and all those kinds of things. So it's a really cool technology and it's heavily used. This is the machines when I first joined in the late 1970s into the technology, manufactured by the Coulter Corporation. So this was the first uh, instrument system I was involved back in the late 1970s. Uh, iSight, as Steve talked about, is a company that I founded here on the campus of the University of Illinois to make a new generation of high throughput cell sorters that had uh, parallel capabilities and were inside of biosafety cabinets so they could be suitable for human therapeutic application. And so these were a few of the products that we sold here. And we built a multi-million dollar business here in the research park, designed, built, manufactured, and shipped these around the world. Uh, eventually then, this company was sold to the Sony Corporation, and it continues on as Sony Biotechnology. And so these machines that we made down here now look a lot more like this because they're now designed by Sony engineers, and they're really big into making things look cool and Sony-like. So, uh, uh, but these are, are very, being very, very well received in the marketplace and uh, doing very well uh, moving forward as Sony Biotechnology. Uh, I left that company and then uh, more recently have joined a company called Cytonome. Uh, Cytonome is in Boston and Cytonome is, is focused on, on biotechnology applications of cell sorting, uh, more on an industrial scale. And this machine over here right now was developed for a human therapeutic sorting. It's a microfluidic parallel system that sorts lots and lots of cells very fast but can be done in a sterile environment. And, and we are partnering with a company that's taking this through. Uh, we'll be entering clinical trials with this device very soon for a human therapeutic application. So I just kind of mentioned, uh, I fell into this by accident back when I was a kid uh, and just getting started as an engineer and have kind of stayed uh, a career involved with this particular technology throughout my life. And so I, I just mentioned that to everybody here when you're trying to figure out what in the world I'm going to do. You never know what opportunities are going to come along. Now, we want to talk about what happens here at the University of Illinois. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the, I came here in 1993, and we founded a company in 2001 in that little machine shed there, uh, the, before the research park. We had about 800 square feet in there uh, to start a little cytometry business. And by uh, about 2012, we had moved into this building and built this building, which is a 46,000 square foot building, which still stands in the research park and had uh, design engineering, manufacturing, and so forth here, again, shipping tens of millions of dollars of product that were developed here, manufactured here, uh, out around the world. And this is the company that Sony bought. Uh, they stayed here then uh, for a few years and now have moved all this operation to Tokyo and to the West Coast. I, I show this because uh, it is interesting. I was working full-time in the University of Illinois as the director of the Flow Cytometry Core Facility. I see Liz is back there. Liz Greeley was someone who was doing a lot of research using our core facilities. And so the, the, uh, the, the environment here allowed me to uh, start a company at a very low cost here, uh, attract the necessary funding to move it forward, ultimately build a successful company making a large-scale instrumentation, and then eventually, as we talked before, sell that company. And that all happened here in Champaign, Illinois. There are other companies that have been very successful in the healthcare space. Strata, Katherine Kleinmetz had a company named Strata, very successful. And that was more in the data and, and healthcare record space. So I, I'm, I'm making the point that there are examples of people who have started taking it through and exited here, several of them here in the community in healthcare. Uh, we're still here as TechMel in the research park, and so it's a, a small engineering company here. And what we've done is try to help start a number of other early stage companies. And so we have been influential. Uh, of course, there's Eyesight, but in Photonic Air, which uh, they've, they've moved forward and they have a product very close to coming to market using uh, OCT technology uh, in an otoscope. 
uh, Prenosis, which started out as a device company, but is now very much focused on, on data and, and, and associated with sepsis and be able to understand that. Uh, Health Scholars, which was done in conjunction with OSF Healthcare. And that's an education company in virtual reality. Uh, this is not, this is in, in life science, but not healthcare, but vaccines. Uh, Aptimune is a company that produces porcine vaccines. I mention that because we learned a lot about how to do, uh, to take something from just a cell line and a virus that was isolated here at Illinois through contract manufacturers to the point of having approval for use in the field. And now there are multiple products in the market that came from that. And most recently then LiveVX, which has a, a, a very interesting imaging technology. I saw Howa Tu just walk in over there. He's the inventor right there associated with LiveVX. And uh, this is maybe the most recent startup we've been involved in that will be re related to healthcare. That will provide uh, biopsy, uh, uh, special tools that don't require labels in order to do uh, normal, normal uh, histopathology uh, uh, in, in, on, on human samples. And so I use this as examples of these are technology companies, software and hardware that, that and there are many more, but these are examples that we've been involved with uh, here at, at the University of Illinois. So I'm going to say just a few words about the path to product development because there are, there are a lot of different ways you can go about it, but, but the way to think about it is this, and Jed is sitting here on the front and he's big on teaching lean startup principles, and this is kind of an example. So I have this Venn diagram here, which represents the blue circle, the blue oval there, represents kind of the universe of things that, that are really needed. So there's a real need for things in the blue circle. And the triangle over here with the really sharp angles represents the things that technology people like engineers and scientists can make. And you'll see then the intersection is the stuff that will actually make sense to do in some way or another that it could be done. So you can see, first of all, that there's a lot of things that people want that engineers and technologists can't provide. And we kind of see that in life. I mean, that, that's just true. There's a lot of things that we want. But there's also a lot of stuff that engineers and scientists can provide that really nobody wants. And so that's kind of that just yellow only area outside there. So then you have that intersection. And then inside that intersection, you have kind of this amorphous shape that if you're actually going to try to make a business out of a product, that would be the, the things that fit in that amorphous shape there. And that is, it's, and it's kind of always changing. And then the little star then is something that happens to actually succeed if all the stars align and it works. So I've got my little person out here of the people that want, and then I'm going to bring up a little engineer scientist person over here. And so the people looking for solutions are kind of wandering around in the wilderness of their universe trying to find the answer to what they need. And the engineer scientists, of course, that want to invent things, like probably some of you in the crowd today, we might have budding inventors here, right? They tend to wander around in this space. Out here on the edge, the bleeding edge of technology and new things that can be done, but you'll see that they tend to wander around in that space, in the space where nobody's going to want that. They're wandering out here on the bleeding edge, but it doesn't have a particular practical use. And so what the lean startup stuff and the things that we talk about here, if we, if we say, I'd like to invent something and be involved in bringing something to market that's actually going to do something to help patients or improve health care or impact the world in a positive way. The way to go about doing that may be to bring this person, but rather than being over there, let's bring the engineering scientist up against and talking to the people that actually need or want something. And let's have them working very closely together to educate one another. And then together they say, well, let's try that. Well, we didn't quite get that right, but let's try again. We got a little closer this time. Let's try that. And then pretty soon they, they, they land on the right thing. So you can learn a lot more about all of this, but I do want to mention this because if you are a, a scientist, a medical student, a researcher, someone who plans to innovate or is innovator and interested in this, got great ideas, be careful about just wandering around out here on the bleeding edge of technology and go talk to the people who actually might benefit or use the things that you're doing. So a little bit of philosophy. Now, I'm also going to bring this up because, especially in an area like here at the University of Illinois, you have access to a lot of mentors. I want to talk about one of my mentors for just a moment here, and this is Wallace Coulter. Wallace Coulter is a really interesting individual. He's actually an Illinois entrepreneur. He, he, he lived in Chicago 
when he did his inventing of this machine, which is the Coulter counter. I don't know if anybody, your medical students, anybody ever heard of the Coulter counter? Right? Everybody's heard of that, right? And so this is the Coulter principle down here. I'm going to explain it because I'm going to talk about why I want to explain it in a minute. You would have a suspension of cells in a tube. That's this, the outer thing here that you can see the green cells are floating around in. And the suspension of cells are in a tube in like in saline. So they're alive. Or they're, they don't have to be alive, but they are alive. And then inside that saline, I put an electrode here. And I put a glass tube with a very small hole and another electrode in the glass tube. And then I put a vacuum on, and I pull the cells, some of the cells, through that little opening. And when the cell gets in the opening, it displaces some of the salt water, and it changes the conductivity of the hole. So the, the, if you put a current through the hole, the current will change. If you put a voltage across the hole, the voltage will change. And so you can not only count how many things go through the hole, but by measuring the amount of current or voltage, you now know how much it's changed. Okay? It took me, and I wasn't really good at it this time, but it took me about 60 seconds to explain that principle to you. That principle has, has, has created a $9.5 billion worldwide market in automated hematology since he invented it in the 1950s. That one invention has, has changed the world. You look at a CBC, the CBC happened because of this technology. And it was first invented about 1960. It was in hospitals in the mid-1960s. And then, but you know, 50 years later, we see this almost $10 billion worldwide market that has developed. And everybody uses that in their lifetime, almost on the planet. So what I want to get across to you is when inventions can really matter. And this is a particularly elegant invention. Because I could explain this thing in about 60 seconds, but it changed the world. So I had a very fortunate opportunity to work for Wallace's company and to work with him in the development of this first flow cytometry system I worked on developing, which was the Epics Elite back in 1989. And I learned a great deal from being around such a fantastic uh, engineering entrepreneur. To give you an idea, that's me, back when I was doing that work. And so I, I, I was not always old like I am now. And so I looked like that, and that's how Wallace was, and that's how the world worked is Wallace, who was born in 1913 and invented his machine about when I was born, passed what he had done and his inspirations on to me. I took those and have run with that in my lifetime. And then what I've been trying to do while I've been here at the University of Illinois is to pass some of my in, in, experience and inspiration on to the folks that I have the honor of getting to work with here. And that's just how it works. So I say all of that is that if you're interested in pursuing innovation, in developing things, uh, find a mentor to work with, someone that's been through this, that's shown success in what they've been doing. And we have a number of great examples around here at the University of Illinois. So if you've got an idea or an invention, and I, again, I, I'm hoping we have some budding inventors in here, um, that's great. But I'll warn you that it's very hard to think of something new, you know, something new under the sun. Um, it, 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 it just really is. You can have a great idea, but one thing I'd recommend is you spend a little bit of time thinking about it, but you also, if you've got a great idea, you need to become an expert, which means you just have to talk to a lot of people, and you have to read a lot, and you have to research a lot about the area that your idea is in. Because what I see oftentimes is people have ideas about how to improve something they really don't know much about. They look at it and they go, well, I can, I can make a better one of those. But they really don't have any experience in, well, how did we get to where we got now in that technology? Why is it made that way now? Maybe, maybe, maybe because you're like, well, maybe somebody did think of that before, and they didn't pursue that idea for whatever reason. And that's often what I find is I think I've got a great idea. Then I go start really getting to know experts in that area. And they start telling me why the, the technology or the, the system is applied the way that it is now. And I learn a lot from that. So I just, I just share that with you is that one of the first things to do is if you've got a great idea, go out there. And don't be afraid. If, if you've got something, an idea of something, what you want to do is you want to see if, if somebody can challenge it to the point that it'll be killed. People can kind of put a defense around there. They don't want to hear the bad news. Well, you kind of want to change that idea. You want to hear the bad news because you don't want to waste time really working on something that doesn't make any sense. So I just 
point that out is spend time getting an expert, really review what has been done. I mentioned incremental innovation because we do the COZAD competition, a lot of things around here, and oftentimes I see things that are just incremental in, in, uh, uh, improvement, or I'll see product idea after product idea is, well, we pay $50 for one of these in the hospitals and I can make it for 15 And And again, it's kind of a combination of these things. There's, there may be a reason why it got to 50 with pricing and things like that. And so be very careful about being too consumed on things that are just a small improvement on something as opposed to kind of a change in the way of thinking about something. And if it is an incremental idea, make sure you do the real detailed business analysis because it, there may again be very good reasons why the idea here is. And when I talk about increment, I just mean, you know, so somebody's got a, you've got something here and oh, the buttons are like this. Well, the buttons are inefficient. I'm going to make one with different button layouts and sell that. That's kind of what I mean by an incremental idea. Just something that's a small step forward. So be wary of those. Welcome critical input. And I, I really do highlight the elegance factor. How good an innovation idea, or how well you even understand it, I'd say is, is heavily dependent on how fast you can explain it to somebody. So I explained that culture principle that changed the world, $10 billion, and I explained it in 60 seconds. That's an elegant idea. This person thought of something that had never been done before, came up with an elegant solution, and, and, and you can understand it very, very quickly and explain it very quickly. And so one way to really know, gee, is my idea elegant, is does it take you about an hour to get somebody to understand what you're talking about? Or, or can you really do it in a minute or two and, and just clearly encapsulate, hey, here it is. This, I can understand this. So uh, this kind of elegance factor in ideas are out there. And then is this the one, um, gosh, you know, in all of these things, uh, especially in healthcare technology development and new products and things like that, it takes years and years to go from ideas to something that will be commercialized. And so uh, if you're going to dedicate your time to working on something, take the time to think through, is this really, is this really where I want to be for a few years? And how do I want to do that, right? So these are just some thoughts about if I've got an idea, how do I evaluate this and, and, and move forward. The, uh, the other one is this past the development. Now around here there's a lot of things that happen. There's an ecosystem we're going to chat just a few minutes about uh, relative to how to do startup companies and things. You don't have to do a startup company. Uh, if you want to move forward, there's certainly intellectual property considerations. We can talk about that. But you could consider, gee, I want to do a startup company. I want to be an entrepreneur. But then you can also say, well, gee, uh, uh, another company may want to develop this. You can be a consultant for them, help them move it forward. Uh, or you can also consider that I've got this really great idea. I really want to work in this space. I'm going to keep this idea to myself. I'm going to get through my education and go to work for a company in this space. And I'm going to share the idea there and see if I can work in that space to develop the idea. So you can do it as an employee. You can try to recruit companies to get interested in carrying things forward. Or you could potentially start something yourselves. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that when I think about somebody that's an innovator or having an idea, it's more about the impact of what you're going to do. It's more about, am I going to accomplish this with my time in my life? I mean, the most valuable thing I have is my time. The most valuable thing I'll ever invest is what I'm doing with my time. And so the main thing about innovation and ideas is if you really want to push an innovation forward, if something really excites you, then, then you're going to do that regardless of whether you do it in a startup, whether somebody else comes along and wants to fund it in a company, or you're going to find a, a company, go to work for them and become a scientist or a, a physician or whatever in that company to carry that product forward. So I guess what I'm trying to do is separate the commercial aspect of this from the internal passion that someone has to really see something change, to really see something happen. And when that grabs you, uh, it, there's nothing else like it. I mean, there, I don't think there's any other high than something like that. So here at the University of Illinois, there's Enterprise Works. And you can go online and see about Enterprise Works and all the programs they have. That's a business incubator, one of the best ones in the country. That we're, we're glad to have it here. They run all kinds of programs to teach about entrepreneurship. There is the Technology Entrepreneur Center, which Jed down here is, is the leader of. And, and, and there is an ecosystem here that consists of resources from the business school, from the academic 
the Academy for Entrepreneurial Leadership, the Technology Entrepreneur Center in the School of Engineering, uh, Enterprise Works uh, over on campus, and then the Office of Technology Management, which takes care of all the patents. These people work together very seamlessly to provide this big list of programs and opportunities. I'm not going to go through this. This slide is here. There's a whole bunch of links. Whoops, there's a whole bunch of links down in the lower section of this slide. I imagine these are put out for people to use. You can explore those. But I do want to say that compared to about any other campus, I think, in the country, this campus right now has one of the smoothest, best working, and, and most expansive uh, systems for helping young entrepreneurs or new entrepreneurs move forward in the technology arena. So I encourage you with that. It's, it's very successful. There's also i -Corps. I just went through i as a mentor with a program. Uh, Jed is also involved in, in the i program. This is run by the National Science Foundation. And the NSF decided that they, uh, they, they looked at how uh, their small business innovative research grant dollars were being spent. And they found out a, a few years ago that they spent a lot of money making things that nobody wanted, kind of like my picture before. And so they started this i program to take academic, people who are in academia, to take uh, academicians through courses to teach them about how to approach entrepreneurship through this program. They supply a grant for it. You put a team together and you go through this training. It's fantastic. We have a local node here. Uh, Jed runs courses here on campus. But you can also go to the national program, which, again, we've taken a couple of, I've been uh, honored to go on a couple of teams, the national program. Um, I'm going to skip that one and talk about COZAD. Uh, this is a venture challenge. You don't have to have a company to be involved in COZAD. Again, you could go to the TEC website and learn a lot about it. But it's a business plan competition, again, teaching you if you're interested in entrepreneurship about how you would approach this very much from the business development, lean startup, things like that. And so it's a fantastic composition, and it has wonderful prizes. Uh, they get handed out so you can get a little bit of money to move something forward. There are also, and this slide's kind of off scale there for some reason, but there are also a number of regional accelerators and programs, but I highlight Matter up here. Matter is a healthcare incubator, or excuse me, uh, well, it's an incubator, I guess. It's a healthcare incubator up in Chicago. It's, uh, it's, it's located in Merchandise Mart uh, up in Chicago. And they run all kinds of programs about... Uh, uh, how to build new technology companies. It's a great place to mix with people and, and that part of wanting to find other people in the space. Um, I, I would say that locally here, taking a trip up to Matter and going to a few of their seminars and things that happen up there would be really useful for you to build connections and to meet people, uh, more, more and more people in, in the area that you're interested in innovating. But my point about this is, again, getting back to what I said before, if you've got an idea for innovation, get out into the world and start meeting people who know a lot about this that you can connect with to understand, does this make sense to go forward? So I, I did want to pause here. And what the, ne the, next, the last few slides I'm going to show here. So there are some, some people of, of the generation of mine. I mean, the, everybody sitting here on the front row are, are entrepreneurs here at Illinois. They've all had successful companies from uh, Professor Bovart, Jed, Marty. All of these people have developed things. Uh, I've had a successful company here at, at the University of Illinois. Um, but we're kind of getting a little bit older. Not, no, nothing wrong there. What I want to get is, is make sure I'm really clear here that this isn't just theoretical I'm talking about, about participating in innovation while you're here at the University of Illinois. I want to go through a series of slides of people who came here to either do their degrees or as postdocs who have started companies. And those companies are well-funded and moving forward rapidly uh, in the space. And, and they're uh, associated with healthcare. This is Bobby Reddy. Uh, Bobby uh, is one of the co-founders of Prenosis. Uh, they started out on a device for diagnostics in sepsis, a kind of a handheld device. And they pivoted now much more into data and collecting enormous amounts of diagnostic data related to sepsis. And, and they look like they were going to be extremely successful in that space. This was Bobby's passion. He, gained, he, he, he was taken with this passion when he was here. I don't know if any of you at Carl, he, you know, he spent a couple of years at Carl, in the halls at Carl, working on things there. Uh, he's an excellent example of somebody that came here got infected with a passion to work on a problem, 
and now he's put several years into building that company. Um, Ryan Shelton. Ryan Shelton's company just recently moved out of Enterprise Works. Uh, he's the CEO and co-founder of uh, Photonicare. Uh, Photonicare has an OCT, uh, Otoscope technology, and they have been moving through the uh, FDA approval process, and I would expect to hear very soon that they'll have market approval for their product. And they took that, this is University of Illinois technology, taken all the way through to an actual medical device product right here uh, at the campus, University of Illinois. And Ryan's company recently moved over into uh, on Fox Drive, but he's still uh, very, very much local here. Adil Akhtar, probably everybody here knows Adil. It would be hard to be in the space here without knowing Adil. Another, you, you'll not meet a more passionate entrepreneur or individual in your life than Adil. You just, you're just inspired being around him. Have him tell you about his trip to Ecuador. Uh, he, uh, of course, is working in the area of prosthetics and has, has made tremendous advances in design materials and substantially reducing the cost of delivery of high quality prosthetics. Again, an innovator right here at campus. Uh, this is Ashley Moy. Uh, Ashley had, was co-founder of CAS21, developing a, a, a new technology for the rapid, uh, you know, a, a, the, basically a cast here rather than plaster casts, having the ability to, to, to rapidly have casts that could be quickly and easily fitted. Company's been very successful. Again, this is something started here. Technology has moved forward. I think they're headquartered up in Chicago now but also very, very uh, accessible to us. But a young uh, entrepreneur started here, carried through, and, and moving forward with a very successful company. And I'm a little partial to this one. Um, this one is, is my son, Matt, uh, and he's working with Howa, that I mentioned over there before, with LiveBX. And uh, Matt's office is now, he's in Enterprise Works, and they recently uh, have been awarded an, an SBIR uh, to, uh, to develop their, uh, their imaging technology and also have some commercial contracts in play here. Uh, how uh, uh, Matt and I went, to, went through the i program recently, and so we'd be great people to talk about what's i like. So, and there are many more. I, I just wanted to, 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 to show these, though. These are examples not of, of, of old farts like me who have, say, God, you know, I did this 40 years ago. These are examples of people who came out of our environment here took advantage of the ecosystem that's present here at the University of Illinois and are all leading companies that are funded with more than a million dollars. Some of them, many more than a million dollars. I mean, this is, this is real. And these are people you can pick up the phone and talk to. Every one of these people that I've mentioned here would be happy to have a conversation with you about your ideas, about why you, what, what your interest is in entrepreneurship or how to develop technologies or how to move something forward. So my hope has been that I've been able to share, one, the perspective of someone who largely my life has been a life of innovation in technologies in healthcare in the field of flow cytometry. Uh, I landed here at the University of Illinois at kind of a, a very fortunate and lucky time. Uh, during this period where Illinois was moving from rec er, or developing this, this ecosystem for innovation and commercial development of technologies. And, and I've had a, a wonderful time participating in that here, both in my own company, iSight, but in also helping um, many of these other companies as they've, they've moved through this. And so I, I just want to share with you, uh, you know, the opportunities that are here. Uh, I'm certainly available to chat with any of you anytime about what you're doing and how you might consider moving forward. The folks here in the front row are all people who have experience that would want to do that. Um, we're just putting that in, in invitation out there, and, and, uh, and I hope that, uh, that, that this has been kind of useful information, and I look forward to having more conversations with some of you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gary. That, that was really, uh, I, th I think, inspirational, but also um, just an excellent example of the resources and the opportunities here. Uh, as part of this program, what we wanted to do is really to have Gary speak briefly, but also now uh, I'd like to introduce our panel that can talk a little bit about of what they heard, uh, raise some questions and some of their own experience. And of course, we can open this up to, to any questions either here in the room or at Carl as well. Um, let me in introduce um, some of our panelists. So first, 
uh, Jed Taylor that we heard about, uh, executive director of our Technology Entrepreneur Center, and really a person who has built uh, this ecosystem here and is, is in touch with all aspects of that. Uh, Professor Marty Burke, many of you know him from uh, being the um, associate dean for research in the College of Medicine, but also a very successful professor and entrepreneur uh, with his company as well, looking at molecular prosthetics. Uh, and of course, I, I think I'm the third person on this panel as well, um, having been through a lot of the technology developments out of the lab and going through our, our ecosystem here uh, to, and bringing those to different products. So maybe I'd like to just turn this over and have Jed uh, comment on some of what you heard and introduce more details. Uh, great. So happy to be here, and, and it's exciting to see this many people here and, and interested in it, and people people online as well. So a couple of thoughts I had. Uh, it, it was exciting to see the uh, the people at the end. Like I, I really like the, the the slides of examples at the end of students, because we worked with all of those students. There were there were students and then then successful entrepreneurs. I think the other thing that was and, and that they have leveraged the ecosystem to go through and take advantage and, and leverage the resources that are available. I think the other interesting thing is that there are many other entrepreneurs that have leveraged as well. And I was, I was thinking on the, walk, on the walk over here of who else has leveraged this and what other good examples do we have. And it was, it was fun to see Dr. Labriola as I was walking in as well. And it, I figured she would be in here. Because uh, uh, Leanne is a good example of a, or a, a physician at Carl that's also uh, partnered with a, a, a faculty member here in the College of Engineering and launched a, a business and, and leveraged the ecosystem on campus. And uh, there are several other examples. I, I was thinking of Dr. Allison Jones, who's a, a Christie Clinic physician that's uh, developed some technology and also has leveraged the ecosystem, another good example. And I thought of several other ones. I had a call, uh, in, in another good example of how the, the just this, this ecosystem we've built is Leanne introduced me, or Dr. Labriola introduced me to a, 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 a surgeon on campus or at Carl that that she had uh, come in contact with and introduced me to this this surgeon, and then he was work he is working currently working with a, a camp or a, a faculty member on campus, and I just had a call with him yesterday, and they're getting ready to submit an SBIR grant. For those that aren't familiar with those, those are equity or those are grants from the uh, government for hundreds of thousands of dollars of equity free funding, and so is working with them, and they're working with somebody else on campus to get that funding to launch their venture. And I just thought, what a good example of people or this this combination of faculty. Um, Carl physicians working together with the ecosystem to launch a venture. And these are just some of the examples of the resources available to students, uh, Carl physicians, and they're, they're, they're no cost to you to help you take an idea and try and launch it. So those are just some good examples. That was, that was coming, coming to my mind. So I just want to, so I'm available to talk through this panel or afterwards to just talk about the resources that are available to you while you're here. That was just kind of the first thought I had. Any questions from the audience? Yes. So let me repeat the question for people that are, should I repeat the question? So the question is, are there people on campus that can help you with external funding? So the person that asks, asks the question is, says that he's in the middle of an SBIR and, and getting ready to do, raise some external funding. Is there people on campus that can help him with that? Did I state that correctly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I would reach out to someone, any any of us in the ecosystem, me, somebody down at Research Park. We all have connections in that in the that have you know with the venture capital community. There's Illinois Ventures is another good place to start. Even if they're not if they're not going to invest or they don't have the the means to invest or are not interested, we they all have connections as well and are happy to make those inter introductions. Uh, Sarah Ventures is another good one in town. They do a lot of investing. If not, they're happy to make introductions as well. But anyone in the ecosystem system are happy to connect you to others. I, another good resource is, and I'll let Marty talk to this, but talk to people that have raised money in, that are on campus that are in that space. Uh, I've seen a countless number of, of ventures in, uh, on campus that have raised funds that found their investors by talking to somebody else in the community that have raised money. 
and have made those introductions. So, but just reach out to somebody in the ecosystem. Somebody else. I, I would say stay in the lab as long as you possibly can, uh, because that's where it's easier to get money. I mean, if you can if you can continue to bring research dollars in, you have a lot more flexibility while you're in the lab, uh, and and you then you want to be very selective about what you would then want to bring out to try to raise money, because to raise raise capital outside is more difficult. But I try to keep it in the lab as long as possible. Sometimes you'll start a company though only for the purposes of trying to gain SBIR support, and so if the main purpose is to help help augment and that, that that might make sense. So there's that talk about the value of death in PD2 and what that means. Uh, but that's that's a this point where you know, funding from federal like NIH or like grant support that takes away and a company is burning through dollars and doesn't have enough investment and revenue to kind of keep you out of that valley of death. And that's that's a real pressure at the time. But I agree with uh, what Gary was saying too if you can if you can keep your technology in the lab getting R01 type support uh, as long as possible, even build clinical prototypes. This is something that we've done in my own group and have experience of. If you build the clinical prototypes, you be the first to do the studies, uh, you get all that. The investors love to see that first demonstration early, and that's something that the company doesn't have to do. Yeah, that's a big uh, yeah, they're, they're, yeah they're, they're at the yeah. other side. Any other questions? We'll let Marty. So just to come back to a couple of the points that were made earlier. First, I want to highlight one of, uh, Gary, your slides that I absolutely love is your Venn diagram. Yeah. I think it's such a powerful way to kind of capture what we're aiming to discuss here today. So I think everybody comes at it from a different spot. But the one thing that I've kind of felt that I have really share in common, everybody who's ever wanted to try to become an entrepreneur or an innovator, is a, it's an impact-driven impulse. It's like, at the end of the day, so I'll just tell you my own personal story. I had my like quarter life crisis when I was 23. I was in medical school, and I realized, OK, doing anatomy and physiology, oh my gosh, this is a mess, and I've got about 60 years left. I remember having that feeling. And so I said, all right, how am I going to spend my chips? Right? It's, mm -hmm. That's it. Time is the most valuable thing we have. So for me, it really came down to thinking about you know, what's the most impactful thing I could try to do next. And I think that's for a lot of people that I've met in the space. That's that is the driver. So there's all these like positive things, of course, that come from perhaps making a company, and you know you can get excited about it. It can be prestige. And maybe there's money. It's like there's just different parts. But the most important thing, it's a vehicle for impact. It's like a mechanism, right, to take something you're dreaming about and have real opportunity to turn it into something that hopefully society can benefit from. And so I think that's what. We have now, as with the New Carlinville College of Medicine and the ecosystem that already exists, it's all about empowerment. So to me, the whole purpose of what we're talking about here today is to better empower people who feel that way to go for it. And I think it's fair to say, as Gary pointed out, this is an incredible place to do that. And I think we've literally scratched the surface. Like, you know, like that tip of the iceberg image. I mean, the untapped potential in this ecosystem here at Illinois to do totally world-changing, transformative things, we've barely scratched the surface. And so I think the message is hopefully coming through that if you're excited about that, go for it. The other two things I'll just mention, freedom to fail is critical. So everybody I've ever met who succeeded failed, like, and failed and failed. And then the key is, of course, you just don't give up. So failing freely. Failure is an opportunity. Like Failure is a learning chance to go for it better next time. If we really believe that and have an ecosystem that celebrates that, and you don't feel ashamed when you fail, you're actually you're now much smarter next time, right? Because you know it's definitely not going to work if I go through it this way. And I think more shots on goal, more freedom to operate, more of that free spirit uh, is really critical. Okay? And we're working really hard to try to help create that environment as much as possible. And then the last thing I just want to emphasize, it's the mentorship. Like, Find somebody right, who can tell you about their failures and the things that they learned and is willing to give you criticisms and suggestions on your ideas. It's your best friend okay, in this uh, space. So anyway, those were kind of some general thoughts. Happy, obviously, to go in deeper on any of the specific uh, questions. Uh, this is kind of what I was going to add.
Sure. Yeah, so we can all speak to that. Well, you, you guys have done it from, from one side or the other. I mean, I, I, I've never really been an academician, so I, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm excellent doing that. Um, uh, I, I would say that if you, if you want to build a company and you want to lead it, you, the balance is you have to go do it. Uh, you, can't, you can't lead a company and, and maintain another career. Now, at the same time, though, many people are very, very successful at being able to create ideas and have them translated by other people into products. And they have many, many companies started from that. And that's what is kind of represented here. I think that that, that model works very, very well. So you guys can speak to that. Yeah, speak to that a little bit. So yeah, the question was, uh, in term, for those at Carl, to balance the academic scholarly pursuits with more of the business development, the idea development. And uh, it's something that I think that in our community, is we always have to kind of question and ask ourselves. Um, you know, we have a lot of ideas. Our students uh, that we work with, you know, generate these ideas and the, these results. And of course, we have that academic kind of mission, uh, really, to further their career and, and advancement as well. But, but the opportunities then to take those ideas, to disclose those to our Office of Technology Management, which I should also say, as part of this ecosystem, is really key because there's expertise there that could come in and evaluate ideas and, and see if that's something that's you know has that market potential if it can if it's possible to be patented uh, who might be interested in that so I think those opportunities exist um, but I think that's what we, in terms of the the faculty the students we generate those ideas and then it becomes a question of what do we do with them so those ideas can be disclosed and and are owned by the university for instance um, but those can be licensed to big companies or they could be licensed to startup companies and and faculty can choose uh, or students can choose to to go to that startup route license that that IP at, at very you know reasonable terms because you know everybody wants these individuals to succeed and uh, and then of course you know build that capital or that that product uh, I think what's also important in that decision, is, as Gary mentioned, you've got to have the champion that can, can drive that, uh, that idea or technology or company forward. Um, in, in my case and in several other faculty cases, what they've done is, is really found those individuals. They may come out of the lab. So the companies that I've started, uh, one has been co-founded with a fellow uh, faculty colleague of mine who really wanted to go that business route. Um, another has been a postdoc and a research scientist out of my lab who you know, wanted to go that, that career route with a startup. And so they're the ones that can champion and take that and run with those, those ideas. Um, I usually, I see myself as a professor, as an idea generator, and our labs here as being the R&D arm for these, these small companies that don't have that, that infrastructure. So we continue to innovate and generate IP that the companies can license until they can build up their own. And, uh, and they're in close proximity, and we can consult and really drive those, those ideas forward. So, but some people, some faculty, will take a sabbatical and, for a year and, and drive the company themselves. So there's, I think, a lot of options. Uh, and having that academic environment is, it gives you a lot of flexibility, too. The only thing I would add is it, there are certain problems that are very much best suited for your lab. And then there are other problems that are very much best suited for a company situation. And I think. Thinking about those differences is really key. So, for example, you know, you can do very basic, fundamental questions and answers in a basic science lab where you don't have to justify any type of financial value associated with them or any type of business plan or pathway to get there. The goal there is to publish a paper and to advance uh, knowledge. Then there are, of course, projects that have really important basic science elements, but they're opening doors right, to potentially translatable outcomes. And as a project evolves in a lab, it can reach a point at which you realize our lab can't take this where we really want it to go. I mean, a lab can't always run a clinical trial and get FDA-approved IND packages together and all these things. And so there's where companies play a really big complementary role. And again, it's just all about trying to have impact and just different mechanisms to try to get there. But I think it's very clear as the power of kind of the academic and then co-founder interface is that you get to, in a sense, try to do both, thereby actually hopefully try to really impact society and keep things in the place that they belong so that you can actually ultimately get to that impact factor. So I don't know if that helps, but there's a difference between things that fit well in the lab environment 
and incubate and, and have freedom to operate in much longer time frames and lack of milestones and all these th very good things. And then you get into a company setting and now it's go, go, go and really try to compete and get something to be impactful for people. Yeah. I want to see if there's any questions coming uh, to us from Carl. Uh, I think, Jim, if you're there, if there's any. Maybe not. If Just shout out if there are questions that come up there. Um, a question here, though? Um, for, from the Carl side. Oh, I can ask you. Hi. Hi, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. <laughs> from the Carl side, when you're looking at prototyping, um, what resources do you find most valuable that a clinician can do for prototyping? Is there the makeup maker's lab, or how do you tap into that? And a second question would be, what do you see as the biggest weaknesses for biotech innovation here, and what have you done to get around them? I, I can start with the last one, and we can also talk. talk we can start with the last one and kind of talk about microspaces, but for biotech innovation, we don't have any, most of the time, if you have an early stage company, your biotech innovation is going to be done in a, in a contract laboratory, research laboratory. Not, not. We're not going to build one. We don't have that here, but we do. We, there are there are a lot of them around. Um, now, this was not healthcare, but I talked about the vaccine company that was all using contract laboratory resources, but managed from here. And so, I think the resources we would have would be the business people to help with how does one go about finding and engaging the CRLs to do the work? How do you put the plan together? Maybe helping to recruit project management staff and things like that so that you can actually operate it from here. But I'd say if what you have is a real biotech application, probably it's going to be a matter of, okay, let's find a CRL or a set of CRLs that meet the need uh, to really help carry it forward. And that's a great way to do it, by the way, because it moves quickly that way. So the other thing I could add, there are some cases where the prototype manufacturing part is so challenging that it really still benefits from the basic science kind of lab interface. So we have an example of this. Actually, Arun Chakabrodi's here in the audience. Uh, there's a case where we're trying to get an antifungal compound advanced forward. The science and the chemistry that is required to actually move prototypes forward is so challenging and so kind of still has big fundamental questions associated with it that we figured out a mechanism via which we can actually have postdocs at the IGB working on academic problems that collectively we hope are going to lead to a really important molecule that could hopefully help a lot of people. And so we did a, an interesting mix. And so I think there's real opportunities there. Mm -hmm. Like, because we have this ecosystem, we can be very creative where the goal is always the same, impact, right? Eventually, yes, we'd love to get it all mm -hmm. uh, licensed to Sony and they take it all forward. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work that has to happen to get it to that stage. So being very creative about how to work together and create soft landing spots for really good ideas that can they can still have some room to wiggle and grow, I think is really important. Um, the other thing that we should talk a lot more about is how to do clinical trials with low barriers to access. Obviously, safety first. Like the number one thing is do no harm. But there's ways in which we can be more creative, I think. A lot of other places do this where, you know, as part of a student's thesis, they'll do a little mini clinical trial as their last chapter. And that's like their last chapter of their thesis. We tried this out in seven patients. This is the early data. And what an amazing way to end your graduate thesis, right? We don't do that much around here. And I think there's lots of opportunities. If we could team up at Carl to do that, that would be great. Related to the device stuff, I just wanted to point out on this slide, if the slides are put out there, is the list of maker spaces that are available to everybody. And, and maybe Jed was going to mention some of those. Yeah, well, th thank you for the, uh, so, the, yeah. the easy prompt. So yes, yeah. we are so excited about the kind of empowerment that comes from maker spaces. And so as you know, the Health Maker Lab, which I think we can now collectively talk about as a, a community-wide creation, mm -hmm. which from molecules up to buildings, you now, as a non-specialist, can walk into an actual maker space and have the idea you dreamed up turned into a prototype. We're the only place in the world where that is true. And as you know, we're trying to get very creative about how to bring people in who have traditionally been left out of the innovation space. You know, everyone wants to be healthy, all 7.7 .7 billion of us. And so if we can capture all of those really great ideas and get on-demand prototype fabrication much more accessible, that's the idea behind the Health Maker Lab. The, Makeathon competitions. We just had one last week, and then the big open community competition in the spring. And so, we encourage everybody to participate and continue to grow together. What has actually turned out to be an incredibly special, unique thing we have now at uh, Carl Illinois and campus wide, in collaboration with the Granger College of Engineering, which is really, really exciting. So, the, the last thing I'll mention is this. Gary pointed out this chart right here. 
If you go, the, the you'll see the, down in the bottom right-hand corner, it is located on entrepreneurship.illinois.edu. If you go on there, there's the Campus Entrepreneurship Portal. You'll see a lot of resources on there. This is one thing that's listed. You'll see a lot of other things listed. There's qu and, and a lot of things are broken out by questions that we, we surveyed a lot of people on campus and in the community about what are the top questions you have when you're trying to bring something to market. And you'll if you click on those, you'll see the uh, broken down in sub-questions, and, and they point to a lot of resources on campus. You'll see a, a thing on there that's the, uh, the startup list. It's a crowdsourced list of startups started by found, or, uh, alumni, uh, students, and faculty at the University of Illinois. If any of you here have started companies and you don't see your company on the list, submit it. It's a crowdsourced list, so don't get mad at me if it's not on there. You just haven't given us the information. But go check it out. You'll see a lot of resources on there that are available to you, to students, uh, if the just free available to you. So go check it out. Yes. Sounds like something to everybody. <laughs> so I, so I, I love this. Um, but I wanted, at, most of you know, I'm the chief advancement officer for the Carl Illinois College of Medicine. And I wanted to reiterate the importance of being able to describe what it is that you're doing in layman's terms in an elegant way. I, nothing could be more important. So whether you're starting out in the lab and you're, you're early, early stage, you may want funders who are foundations that are funded by people who do not have expertise in your area, but they have a passion for what you're doing. So the more you can boil down what it is you're doing in simple terms that people can understand with analogies. I mean, my favorite is talking about CAR T cell research as Pac-Man eating cancer cells. I mean, what could be easier to understand? So find ways to describe it in a way that anybody can understand, and that will carry you through, because you may be looking at foundation funding early on before you get your governmental funding and before you get your venture capital funding. And all the way through that, you're going to need to be able to describe it. Um, just, just a comment. So, you know, I start. I'm also I'm a physician at Carl and uh, have uh, joined one of the faculty people, uh, and we are working on a company. Um, it's, you know, I'm a full-time clinician and the professor is a full-time professor. It's a, it's, it's a very rewarding experience. However, it's very, very challenging because you're kind of doing it on the side. Um, so if Early on, you can think in your mind you want to carve out some time to do this, some you know this exciting venture. It it, it behooves you to kind of carve out some time in your schedule, um, but also triangulate it with a business person early on. So I think I think one thing we could probably improve on is to make that triangulation easier, um, because you know in my experience I had to kind of search search things out and still kind of searching things out. So if if like a clinician finds a faculty member, um, and it's like you know, marriage in heaven, whatever. You you just want to have a turnkey opportunity and say, okay, here you go. You're gonna go here. Here's how your this is your business plan, and kind of go from there. You know, and this is what you're gonna do with your IP, because right now it's still a little bit of feeling feeling around in the dark. But I think opportunities are all there. I agree. Ecosystem is here. We have it all here. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good good opportunity. Yeah, they have it all here. I and, and, and I try to get this across to students and, and of course, Dean, you, you, you do this all the time. We're at a place where the sum total of the knowledge of our species is collected. And when the students are here, I tell them there's not a time in your life when you're going to be exposed to a place where all of that's in one place. It's also a place where anything that could possibly be made on this planet could be made at this place. We have people and, and resources that we could make anything, be it from the life science, from molecules, to uh, you know, devices, electronics, sensors. There's nothing that could be made by a human on this planet that we couldn't make here. And that makes this one of the most unique places on the planet to be if you're an innovator. So I find that exciting. And I can't think of any other way to end uh, <laughs> with, with those words. So yeah. Gary, Jed, Thanks. Marty, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here.